And I invite you to join me in our Old Testament scripture reading, which this morning is 1 Samuel chapter 30. In your pew Bibles, you'll find that on page 251. Continuing our trek through the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So David set out, and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who stayed be, where those who were left stayed behind. But David pursued, he and four hundred men. Two hundred men stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross to the brook Besor. They found an Egyptian out in open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink. They gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, to whom do you belong? And where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Cherethites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken them down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken. And David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought all back. David also captured all the flocks and herds. And the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they did not go out with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, 
You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he set apart the spoil. He sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth of the Negev, in Jatur, in Aror, in Shifmoth, in Eshtimoma, in Rachel, and in the cities of the Jeramielites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Horma, in Borishan, in Atach, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. In the providence of God, David had been spared from going out to battle with the Philistines against his own people. David had gotten himself into that predicament by relying on his own cunning and trickery rather than relying on the word of the Lord. But God had worked to override David's own foolishness. He caused the commanders of the Philistines to distrust David. And they kept him from riding out to battle with them, even though Achish, one of the Philistine kings, who David pretended to serve, never once doubted David. When David returned home with his men, he found that Ziklag had been plundered and burned by the Amalekites. Their wives and children had been kidnapped. Apparently, the Amalekites had taken revenge on David for his raids against them. Beside themselves with grief, David's men threatened to stone him. They had probably raised objections for a long time about living among the Philistines. Now, they had lost everything on account of David's accursed cleverness. The Lord had apparently forsaken him. David felt forsaken by everything and everybody, including the Lord. But the Lord reveals his grace even in the most threatening circumstances. David was allowed to take hold of the Lord in faith. He now saw that trusting in himself had put him on the wrong path. He called for Abiathar, the priest, and sought the word of the Lord. Abiathar had the ephod, which had held the Urim and the Thummim. By means of these, David was able to ask the Lord for guidance. The Lord gave David a favorable reply. Remember that the Lord would not answer Saul even when he consulted him by Urim. But he answered David. David was the man of God's choosing in spite of his lack of trust in the Lord. David and his men went after the Amalekites to recover their wives, children, and belongings. But 200 of David's men were too tired to join in the pursuit, so they stayed behind. And as we read, David and his men came upon the Amalekite camp as the Amalekites were scattered about, eating and drinking and dancing. They were easy prey for David, and he defeated them all. Not one of the women or children was missing. David and his men took possession of all that belonged to the Amalekites. And after returning with the booty, David ordered his men to share the booty equally with those 200 men who had stayed behind. And from that time on, the law in Israel required that the loot taken in war should be shared that way. 
Not only was David restored to his possessions and to his wives and children and to the command of his men, he also had found favor and fellowship with God again. After the dark days in which Israel had been forsaken by Saul, as well as by David, there was now new hope for the people in David's restoration. The mercy of God, for Christ's sake, did not depart from his people, and therefore it did not depart from David either. Think about this passage today. I invite you to turn with me for our New Testament reading to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 2. Continuing our series on the book of Romans this morning, we'll be reading chapter 2, verse 17, to the end of the chapter, verse 29. Romans 2, 17 through 29, page 940 in the Pew Bibles. This is the word of the Lord. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Congregation of Christ, it's so easy to read the Bible and sometimes to think that the things of which it speaks are written for somebody else rather than for yourself. Of course, whenever we do that, we find ourselves in great spiritual danger. It's kind of like ignoring symptoms of what could be a very serious disease. The Bible is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. It's meant to help us to see our condition as it really is, so we can get help with it. But often, we read or hear scripture in such a way that we don't think it's talking about us. Anybody else but me. The Christian singer Don Francisco once had a song by that name. Anybody else but me. Anybody else but me. He was talking about the hypocrite and Pharisee. Anybody else but me. 
We've been looking at this letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans. Paul was writing so that he could encourage his Roman readers as well as us with the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. But before he could explain why the good news is so good, he had to get his readers to understand why they needed the good news so badly. And so ever, ever since the second half of chapter 1, Paul has been showing how the wrath of God is manifested toward sinners. God's wrath is manifested against sinners who reject the truth of God revealed in creation and who close their minds to the truth in order to worship and serve created things rather than the blessed creator. He sends his judgment of judicial hardening upon those who reject his revelation. That is, he stops restraining their wickedness. And when the restraints are gone, those sinners plunge themselves into the grossest kinds of immorality and depravity. Paul knew that some of those who would read what he wrote about in chapter 1 would breathe a sigh of relief and say, I'm glad he's not talking about me. I don't do those kind of things. So he goes after those kinds of sinners in chapter 2. In this second chapter of his letter, he's addressing people who have a whole lot more revelation about God than simply what's revealed in the creation about God. The people he has in mind are people who know the law of God. These people have special revelation. They have the recorded words God himself spoke, his word, his law, his commandments. It's not until verse 17, which opens the passage we have before us this morning, that Paul reveals that he's thinking about the Jews and how that they too are under God's judgment. He could have come out and said that, in verse 1 of chapter 2. But I suspect that Paul knew that there were some in the church of Rome who may not have been Jews themselves, but to whom the things he would address the Jews about would be equally appropriate. So he held off, specifically addressing the Jews until now. Because if you aren't a Jew, you might simply stop listening and say, he's not talking about me. He's talking about the hypocrite and Pharisee. But he's not talking about me. Verses 17 through 24, Paul gives us one of the most terrible exposures of hypocrisy to be found anywhere in the Bible. Scripture has a great deal to say about hypocrisy. And that shouldn't be surprising, because hypocrisy is one of the most subtle and terrible sins that can ever afflict us. Our Lord Jesus warned his disciples against it when he said, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But this particular sin isn't something which the Pharisees had a monopoly on. It's something to which we all are prone and which threatens every Christian. But having said that, it's a temptation to some more than to others. And the people who are most exposed to this terrible sin are the preachers and teachers of the gospel along with the Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders and anyone who puts a great value on knowing spiritual truth. Sometimes we forget that it's a very serious thing to teach or preach the gospel. Some people give you the impression that it's one of the simplest things in all the world to do. Then anyone can just step up and do it, provided he's somewhat good at speaking, not afraid in standing before an audience. Look at all of the churches, and you'll find 
places where pastors have very little or no theological training. They're nothing more than good speakers or even entertainers. If you're going to preach the gospel, you need much more than to be an engaging speaker. You need to handle the word of truth wisely. You need to know it well enough so that you can defend the truth against error. And that's why in our tradition, ministers have to be taught to read the scriptures in its original languages. But even if you're not a pastor, you may teach the Bible to others in various venues, to your family at home, in a Bible study, or whenever you share the gospel with someone. You study scripture and you study theology so you can grow in your knowledge of Christian truth. And that's all good and proper. But it's so easy to forget the words we find in James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Paul is dealing with such people in the remainder of chapter 2, which we're looking at this morning. He's addressing people who think of themselves as teachers. He's speaking to people who like to speak of what is excellent. He's talking to people who consider themselves as guides to the blind in spiritual matters, instructors of the foolish, teachers of children, He's dealing with people who would say, I'm in the light. If you're in spiritual darkness, I can help you. The Jews were like that in Paul's day. But please, as you hear these things this morning, don't think that Paul's words were meant only for the Jews. Paul is giving us the characteristics of religious, the religious hypocrite. And there are two characteristics which stand out, which you can find in these verses. The first is this. A religious hypocrite is one who tends to take only a general and theoretical and intellectual interest in spiritual truth. And that was the Jew in Paul's day. Paul knew it well. Paul was not only Jewish, he had been a member of the strictest sect among the Jews. He had been a Pharisee. In fact, in Galatians, he writes that he had been a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Pharisee to the nth degree. He was zealous for the law and the traditions of his people. In fact, he was so zealous that he became a persecutor of the church of Jesus. You can be intellectually convinced of the truths of religion, and yet find yourself kicking against the goads and living in opposition to the one who is truth himself. Or you can keep those truths in your head and never put them into practice. Our Lord Jesus constantly warned against this tendency. He called it hearing my words but not doing them. And he told the parable of the wise and foolish builders to illustrate that point. James, in his letter, wrote, Faith without works is dead. It's a fine thing to believe the Christian truth and to have your theology right. But unless your knowledge of the truth transforms your life so that you live and walk according to it, that kind of embracing spiritual truth is the same kind of knowledge that the hypocrite possesses. It's fruitless knowledge. Knowledge of the truth, if it's saving knowledge.
always bears fruit in one's life. Nothing gave the Jew greater joy than entering into an argument about the law. They had been trained in it. They knew it by heart. They had listened to all the great doctors of the law disputing about it, and they enjoyed it all. It's like people today who love theology and enjoy attending conferences on it and listening to podcasts and reading religious books. What a delight! As long as it is purely intellectual. That's the first characteristic of the religious hypocrite. The second characteristic of religious hypocrisy that you discern from what the Apostle Paul writes in these verses is this. It's a kind of general complacency. It's always being self-satisfied, being pleased with oneself, never conscious of any deficiency. You see that in verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law. The King James puts it this way. Behold, thou art a Jew, and restest in the law. The religious hypocrite is someone who is always resting on something. He rests on the law, or relies on the law in a wrong way. And he even boasts before God. In his heart, he says, I'm a godly man. I'm a worshiper of the true God. I don't know about those heathen, but I count myself as righteous in God's sight. It's the kind of thing that Jesus addressed in his parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector who both went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee rested in his righteousness. He was complacent in it to the point that even in his prayer, he looked upon the tax collector with disdain. Are there people in your life whom you look upon with disdain? Are you pretty pleased in yourself? about your standing with God? That's how the Jew whom Paul is describing was. In verse 19, Paul uses the word sure. In the King James, the word is confident. If you are sure or confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in the darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, Paul's painting a picture of the religious hypocrite as someone who's confident. But his confidence is misplaced. And if you this morning are resting on your knowledge of the truth of God as the basis for your salvation, you would do well to look to your heart. For you may be resting on a false assurance that puts you in the same basket as the Jews of old. Are you resting on and are confident that you have a place in heaven because of your faith in Christ? Because of your knowledge of his work on the cross for sinners? Or is your assurance based solely on what he did on the cross for you in your place? I hope you understand the difference. Is your faith resting upon the fact that you believe certain things? Or are you, with all your heart and soul, resting only in what Christ Jesus has done for you? Faith, which is merely intellectual, can't save you. A faith in faith won't save you either. Either. 
You can be confident that you are on the road to heaven as the Jews were confident and as Paul was confident before he was converted. But beware of confidence. Be careful of what you rest in. For confidence must be grounded in the right thing. And it's possible to be confident of your standing with God when everything about you cries out, this person doesn't live up to and denies with his life what he or she professes. And so Paul, starting at verse 21, launches into a scathing series of questions aimed at the religious hypocrisy of the Jew. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You preach against stealing, but do you steal? You say one must not commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You abhor idols, but do you rob temples? And that last one may need some explaining. At the time Paul was writing to the Romans, the Jews had pretty well been cured from making images and worshiping the gods of the nations around them. Seventy long years of captivity in Babylon had taught them that lesson. So they could look at the Gentiles and their idols and hate them. Both the idols and the Gentiles themselves. It wasn't very hard for the Jews to think to themselves, you know, these idols in the pagan temples, they're representations of false gods. Therefore, we should pillage those temples. We should destroy those idols and take the gold they're made of for ourselves. They rob temples. And their justification for it was that God hates idols. Never mind that God said, you shall not steal. I'm not now speaking of the time when God was leading the people of Israel into the promised land when he specifically told them to tear down the altars of pagan gods of the people who were in the land before him. They were authorized by God to do that when they entered the land. But they were to burn the gold and the silver that those idols were made of. They weren't to take the loot for themselves, as the story of Achan in the Bible relates. The Jews in Paul's day, though, could justify stealing on the religious ground that idolatry was a terrible sin. And we must be careful that we don't use religious reasons for doing the very thing that the law of God tells us we must not do. How could some who claim to be Christians in Nazi Germany think that helping Hitler round up and exterminate the Jews would advance the glory of the name of Jesus? How could Christian owners of Negro slaves whip them and treat them so harshly when they themselves professed that they had a master in heaven to whom they should submit? How could a group of Christian young men justify beating up a homosexual classmate or calling a girl a slut while they bear the name of Jesus? I only say these things so that we'll see that Paul wasn't just writing these things to the Jews when he writes about religious hypocrisy. He's writing to us all. Paul writes, Therefore the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The Jews caused the unsaved heathen people who lived about them to say, 
Well, if that's how someone who claims to know God lives, then I don't ever want to know their God. God's name is blasphemed when we profess ourselves to be teachers of the truth and possessors of the only knowledge that can save, but we live our lives as hypocrites. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Save us from having hearts full of religious hypocrisy. There's one final defense that the Jew in Paul's day would raise up against the arguments Paul brings to bear upon his Roman readers. Paul is leading up to saying that both Jew and Gentile are under the wrath of God and will face his judgment. And therefore, whether you're a Jewish sinner or a Gentile sinner, you need God's provision of grace and forgiveness in Jesus. But before Paul gets there, he must destroy the common reply of many a Jew. God won't judge and condemn us. We are his people. We bear the sign of being his people. We are the circumcision. We are the circumcised, and we have circumcision. Paul's response is simple and it's devastating. Circumcision has value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you have not been circumcised. Do you break the law? God's law? If you do, you're no better than if you had not been circumcised. You see, behind Paul's words lies the truth that to obey God's law means obeying it perfectly. If you don't obey it perfectly, you're no different than the uncircumcised. You know, some people have a hard time reconciling Paul's teaching in the book of Romans with James, James's teaching in the letter of James. Martin Luther was famously a person who had a problem with that. Many people have had a problem with that. But actually, if you read those books, there's no disagreement between Paul and James. Just listen to what James writes in chapter 2, verse 10 of his letter. He says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, is guilty of breaking it all. Paul is saying, you can't claim circumcision is a thing that will save you from God's judgment unless you keep all the commandments of God. And if you do keep all the commandments of God perfectly, then you have nothing to fear on the day of judgment. Do you really keep all his commandments perfectly? And if someone who has never been circumcised did, hypothetically, keep the law's commandments, we know nobody does, but hypothetically, if they did, wouldn't they be regarded as though they were circumcised? He who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code in circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. Such a person's praise is not from man, but from God. Circumcision won't save you. It's only the outward sign and seal of belonging to the people of God. 
You mustn't rely on circumcision for your standing before God in the great day. And you mustn't rely on the fact that you are baptized either. Baptism is also the outward sign and seal of an inner reality. The question is always, do I possess the inner reality of which baptism is the sign and the seal? And that's true. Whether you've been baptized as an infant or baptized as an adult, the outward sign doesn't convey the inner spiritual reality. It signifies it. It seals the promises of God in connection with it. But if you don't have the spiritual reality that baptism represents, your baptism is meaningless. Now that's not to say that circumcision for the Jew or baptism for the Christian is nothing at all or that it lacks value. I don't mean to steal Pastor Michael's thunder by pointing to you words that he'll be preaching on next Sunday. But just listen to verse 1 and the first part of verse 2 of chapter 3. This is what it says. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. Circumcision won't save you. And baptism doesn't save you. But that doesn't mean there's no value in the, those signs and seals which are given by God. They just can't save you. And that's Paul's point. If you are a religious person like the Jews were, and you're trusting in your religion to save you and resting on something, you may be resting on something which will not stand in God's day of judgment. All your pretended religiosity is only hypocrisy in his sight. Do you know why? Because you don't keep God's law perfectly. What should you do? The Philippian jailer once cried those words out to Paul. What shall I do to be saved? Many, if not most of you, know what Paul said in reply. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You and your house. You're saved through believing on Jesus. But you aren't saved on account of your believing on Jesus. This is what Paul's leading up to. And it's the truth that every sinner who becomes a saved sinner must grasp with all his heart as God changes him and makes him or her into a new creature in Christ. Let's bow our hearts before God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, our Savior, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, comforter, guide, our consolation. Lord, thank you for your word. And I admit, Lord, that this, these are hard words for us to hear because they are talking about us. And hypocrisy in our hearts and our lives is a very great danger. Oh, Lord, as you reveal our sins, lead us to Jesus. Lead us to see that he is the only one who can make us right with you. And grant, we pray, that we might have faith in him and in his blood. In his name we pray. Amen.